We have the, the pleasure to um, see deep sea observations presented by Dr. Alan Jameson. And I think we give him a hand as a welcome, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, well, when I got asked to do a talk at this, I thought it was only right that we spoke about the deepest fish of all of the fish, which is something that myself and colleagues have been doing for about 10 years. Uh, so all the work and all the video I'm going to show is actually the, the work of about probably five or six main people. Uh, and it's all to do with the very deepest fish of all. But to start, a little bit of context. We're all aware of what the world looks like. I uh, don't want to go too much into generic deep sea talk, but I would like to explain why we have areas of the world which are extraordinarily deep, the really deep stuff. So we're all familiar with that type of image of the planet. And when we think about the Atlantic Ocean and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, that's where all the new sea floor is being created, it's where there's volcanoes, hydrothermal vents, all the new sea floor. It was as recent as 1965 when they realized that the Earth wasn't actually getting bigger. That was one of the main theories at the time. And the reason why the Earth isn't getting bigger, even though all the new material is appearing, is if you go to the other side of the planet, these trenches, are, these big deep trenches are actually pushing some of the seafloor back into the Earth's mantle. So it's almost recycling itself. But the point to make here is when you turn the globe to the Pacific, you can quite clearly see there's half the Earth right there is deep sea. Most of that is around 4,000 meters deep. And it's interfered a little bit by these big long cracks that you see, some of these dark lines, and that's where the really deep bits are. But as a little bit of perspective, that whole Pacific Ocean is equivalent to about 26 Australias, which is pretty huge. Uh, the maximum depth is 10,925 meters, which is, sounds a lot. Uh, it's about 6.8 miles. So when we look at the, the Earth and split it up into altitudes from the highest point to the, the lowest point, we end up with a situation looking something like this, when we have Mount Everest up here and Challenger Deep right down here. And the ocean, of course, is about 70%. Average depth is around 300, 400. The land actually only comprises about 30% of the planet, which is, I think, perhaps we don't always appreciate that much. The average altitude is 800 meters. Deep sea is, I don't really believe in the word deep sea. I must admit, I think what happens at 200 meters and what happens 8,000 are quite different. But technically, deep sea is a 200 meter line. And you see most of the planet, actually more than 50% of the planet, are these great big huge abyssal plains, which are a lot of the species that Monty was talking about. Uh, the bit we're concerned about is this last bit. So if you think about, rather than three-dimensional space on the sea floor, and you think about the actual depth range we have on this planet, a lot of it 45% of it is beyond these big, flat, abyssal plains. They might be small in area, but they're huge in terms of depth. And that's the bit that myself and some various colleagues and collaborators have been working on in the last few years. So just to reiterate, because I often talk about Hadel, and quite often it's a term that not a lot of people have come across. It autocorrects to halal when you type it into, into an Apple product. It's pronounced Hadel. It means something very different. And it's basically in keeping with this bathyol abyssal and Hadel. So in this context, it, when I mention Hadel, it means anything deeper than 6,000 meters. All right. So that bit there. So why is it so deep? The reason it's deep is because the Earth, of course, is split into lots of tectonic plates, and they are all interacting with one another. You have various different ways in which the, the, the plates can, can interact. And you have what's called the transform faults, the boundaries, where you've got two plates that like, rub together. They just rub in a sideways motion. A uh, good example of that, uh, San Andreas Fault. You have other places where the trenches are, like, sorry, the tectonic plates are moving apart. So you have these ocean ridges. So we're sort of probably most familiar with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And if there's anyone from Iceland, you'd be quite aware of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, and on the other side, you have subduction trenches. And that's essentially where the two tectonic plates are being pushed together. The heavier one will go down, and you create this valley, this big, deep, deep trench. And that's where the seafloor tends to start to uh, descend around 6,000 meters and can end up in places beyond 10,000. This is where all the deep bits are. 
In terms of what makes a hadal zone deeper than 6,000, there are different geomorphologies which can be uh, included in that term. Most of them, most of the big areas are trenches, and they're here uh, illustrated by the black dots. There are troughs, which would perhaps are significant, we're not quite sure yet. And that's just areas of abyssal plain that happen to cross our semi-imaginary 6,000 metre boundary. And there are trench faults, which we don't actually know very much about because no one's ever really seriously studied those. And those faults are basically where you have ridge systems which have fractured. So it's a fault perpendicular to that. But they happen to go across 6,000 metres. So the Pacific Ocean is very important in all this because about 75% of the world's hadal zones are around the Pacific. So we get good air miles on this project. That's kind of what this trench looked like. It's a nice sort of digital bathymetry. It's a vertical exaggeration on that. Uh, but the purple bits are the deep points and the yellow bits are the shallowest point. This is just to give an idea of what the trenches look like. This is, this is the, the Kermadec Trench off New Zealand. So if you imagine you're flying north across the North Island looking down, that's kind of what you'd see. Uh, and the deepest point being this little bit here, that's about 10,000 meters. Uh, so first of the videos, what I want to explain is how we get the data in the first place, because it's not an easy thing to do. We cannot trawl, although there are a few people who are trying to do that now. Uh, we tend to have to use remote systems because there are not many ROVs. Uh, in fact, there are currently no ROVs that can go that deep. Uh, there's one submersible that can go that deep. Uh, so we have to use a different type of technology. So play this little video. Points to anyone who can identify that island. That's Sofugan, it's uh, south of Japan. So that's a little uh, research vessel we worked on a couple of years ago called Shinyo Maru. It's a Japanese cadet training vessel, but we, this is us deploying the, our systems in uh, the Mariana Trench. So what we do is we pay out a lot of these uh, buoyancy spheres, and what happens is when we release the system into the seafloor, we need buoyancy to bring it back again. So we're not attached to the ship in any way, shape or form. We pay out the mooring line, and then eventually we pick up the big camera system, and that pole sticking out the front is important. That pole at the front has the bait on it, so that's the bit that you'll see in the videos. And we lower a very expensive asset into the sea, and pull a quick release, and it starts to free fall. At this point here, you can see it underwater. So they're kind of expensive, they're about 100,000 euros each, although they are getting less uh, price-wise. So the horrible moment here is when you pull the quick release and it just goes, and at that point, we don't have any control over it anymore. It just descends down through the water column. The cameras will be running at something like one, meter on, uh, one minute on, one minute off for the duration. The only way we can talk to it is through acoustics, and the only commands we can give it are really drop your weights at the end. So when we're done, we tell it to drop its weights and it comes back again. This is a nice piece of footage that they used on the Blue Planet to demonstrate us falling into the trench. It shows the type of, I mean, the terrain that they're showing there again is exaggerated a little bit. It's not quite as steep as that, but you get the idea. At 10,000 meters, it takes around four and a half hours to reach the bottom in free fall. So it's quite, it's quite a long way to go. On the way back up, it's about the same. And as I say, it crash lands, and we use bait to attract animals to us rather than going exploring, looking for them, because the difference in price is about 10 million euros. So we've gone a long way. That's like crash landing on the seafloor, and the big chunk of thing in front of the camera is tuna in this case. We use very oily fish. So diversity of hadal fish, so far we have about 24. I say about because there's some cryptic ones. The problem with videoing fish is that some of the deep sea fish are quite difficult to identify when you have to end up counting teeth. You can't do that on video. But we think there are about 24. Almost half are snailfish. I mean, there's some of the pictures here, the top one is of the, the cuskeels, the ophideids, and the bottom one is the rat tails, which is the macrurids. They're far more common on abyssal plains, but they happen to cross the 6,000 meter boundary. Doesn't necessarily mean they're quintessentially hadal. It just means they happen to cross that boundary. But when you look at the snailfish, of those which are endemic to hadal depth, the snailfish are about 92% of what we find. And that eight, missing 8% 8 is one, one individual of a different uh, family, which I would put money on isn't actually right. But snailfish are kind of cool because snailfish are the deepest fish of all of them. And as a family, they're not even deep sea fish. 
as Monty explained, there are of the secondary invasion, so there's far more species in the shallow water than there are in the deep water. It's almost like being quite evolutionarily audacious by just being a shallow water fish and just bypassing all the deep stuff and going to arm the deepest fish as well. And uh, snailfish seem to have adapted to all sorts of different environments. Uh, you can even find them in river systems. We find them in the river at Newcastle, which is bizarre. So, very, very important data, of course, taken from fish base. So I'll put that in there. So when we started doing this in 2007, believe it or not, that was all we had. That was all of the records of snailfish beyond 6,000 meters. The top one was taken by the Danish Galathea. I think they preserved it in Carlsberg or something like that. I don't know, but it was a very bad specimen falling apart in the middle. The second one, somebody had clearly stood on his head. It was in three parts, and the only way you can tell it is actually a fish is by x-raying the remains. The third one had lost its head, and the bottom one is the only picture of a Hadal snailfish alive ten years ago. That was it. And it was taken in 1985, I think, by the Japanese by mistake. So, uh, it didn't give us, give us a lot to work uh, go and look for the deepest fish in the world. And, you know, I guess we thought we would probably end up finding one or two chance encounters of little fragile fish ecking out some sort of existence at the deepest point. But that's really not true. What we've done is we've gone from this being the only image to regularly capturing images as high quality as this. This is one from Atacama at 7,000 meters. We've gone from the squished up, whoops, I stood on my own fish picture from the X-ray to much more elaborate technologies like 3D cat scanning, uh, whole bodied animals, and you can also see the, the stomach contents inside. That's one there that's swallowed an amphipod. So we've made great progress in 10 years, but the bit everyone wants to see is what they actually look like. So this video here, that image there is the first time they were ever seen alive. That's at 7,000 meters off New Zealand. This is a species called Nautiloparis chimaricensis. And I'll mention a few things as we go through this video. Uh, I'll go for a wander so I can see it as well. Uh, you see suction feeding there. You can see by the way the sediment gets blown out of their gills. So all those little dots buzzing around are amphipods. Amphipods are incredibly important in this whole story. Two months after that, that was July 2007, two months later we went to Japan, put the same camera down at the same depth, and found this one. So this is, you know, something like 6,000 kilometers away. Back in New Zealand again, this is an important video because it shows that these fish are not particularly heavy. They're quite buoyant. They swim free, uh, in, uh, free swimming in mid-water. We only found that out because we accidentally put the camera on the end of a cliff, which is one of the perils of free-falling blind. Uh, but you can see they're quite, uh, quite happy to swim up quite far off the bottom. By the end of this dive, they're actually coming up from the top left-hand corner there. So they are buoyant, but they don't have swim bladders, and that's kind of important as well. A few years later, we went to the Mariana Trench, and amongst other things, we found this guy here. This is something we've never captured, so it doesn't have a, a formal description. We named it the ethereal snailfish because of its obvious fragile nature to it. Uh, this, is a, this is the first time we saw it. It was kind of accidental. This is an inspection camera on a core system. Uh, and the light's so intense, you can see just how fragile these things are. I think this is a really good example of challenging public perception of what the deepest fish in the world would look like. I think most people would expect to see some big black gnarly thing with lures and lights and claws and teeth and all the rest of it. But they're actually extraordinarily fragile. So that was the Mariana one, or the ethereal snailfish, eating something in the sediment now. In March this year, we went back to Atacama again to try and see if we could get more information about that beautiful one I showed in the still image, and we ended up accidentally finding three new species within, I think, a matter of days. Uh, this one here, this is not the one we photographed before, this is a much bigger one. We're imaginatively calling these the blue snailfish, the other one's the purple one and the pink one. But again, it's quite a, a large one there, again, very soft-bodied, quite gelatinous. Uh, that one is a bit less gelatinous than the other ones. The other ones, I don't know if you noticed, you can see a big orange patch on the side of their body. That's actually their liver. You can, when you catch them, you can turn them upside down and almost see the entire internals. Uh, that's the one we filmed a few years ago in that still image. So we've now got footage of it alive. And again, it's roaming around. You can't help but notice quite a lot of amphipods in that photograph. Uh, that's what the snailfish are generally after. So that's it doing what snailfish do. 
And then the third species is that little one there. We were fortunate enough to catch one specimen of that. So we'll uh, be describing that. In fact, the guy sat over there is going to do it. Uh, and that will be the next contribution to fish base, I hope. Um, this shot I just put in here because it's stunning because that's three new species of fish in one video. And that was taken at about 6,900 to 7,000 meters or so. So there are still places we can go and actually predict what's going to happen. Now, it doesn't look like there's much going on there, but this is all around 7,000 meters. When you go to 7.5 or 7.6, 7.8, 7, 7 9,000 meters, you start to see more fish. This is 7,700 off Japan. Now, where's my little laser pointer? The ones to note is here, things to note here are how gelatinous they are. You can see the liver either side of its white muscle here. What's this guy doing? Right? Quite often you'll see in these big aggregations of snailfish that some of them are just lying on the seafloor like they've passed out. They're just that bored to just fall asleep or something. But this is off New Zealand, same depth, different species. Same camera system, same thing happened. If there's any crustacean fans, that's the first ever live footage of a supergiant that happened to be kicking around at the time. And then you go to Mariana, different species again, thousands, tens of thousands of kilometers away, same things happen. What's this guy doing? What are they doing? <laughs> so there, if you, the more you watch these videos, there's more interesting stuff going on. For example, you can see amphipods actually clinging to the back of the fish. And to get the, get the amphipod off, the fish will turn upside down and headbutt the seafloor to get it off. And you have this weird thing where they keep seem to be passing out. But we'll get to that. So geographically, this is all the places we've been. And you find you've got this high abundance of what we're calling the Mariana snailfish. We've recently described that. And you have the secondary one called the ethereal. In New Zealand, you have Chromaticensis, which is quite dominant at the deeper end. And you also have this more slightly less uh, dominant cryptic Stuart eye one. Up in Japan, you have, again, quite a dominant one, quite deep down. And you have the second one, which we haven't caught yet, but the Russians have got a record of this other one called Amblystomopsis. And weirdly enough, in Atacama, you have a whole bunch, but you don't have that big aggregation. And we've, when we look at the trends of this compared to trends of other species, what happens in a big, deep trench tends to be slightly different from what happens in a slightly shallower trench. And again, Atacama is only 8,000. It's not 10. There's also reports from a, a French explorer in 1965 who was roaming around Puerto Rico in his little submersible who didn't have a camera or anything, and he's just writing in his notebook. And he wrote in his notebook that he saw about 200 small pink fish with black eyes. So I'm pretty sure at 7,300 in Puerto Rico, there'll be another snailfish, which is lucky because we're going to go there next month. So talking about similarities, this, this chart here shows the Mariana, Kermadec, and Japanese snailfish. This is just the, the maximum numbers over depth, and you can see they're quite similar. Plus, when you leave the camera down, this is time zeros where the camera lands. You leave it over a period of time. This is the number of fish you see in front of the camera. It's unbelievably similar, even though they're not actually that well related. And there's certainly no connectivity between these. These are isolated by thousands of thousands of miles. So talk a little bit about what these fish do. We need to talk about amphipods. Those are amphipods. They're normally about one centimeter to two centimeters. But the significance in the Hadal zone can't really be understated. This is a time lapse of camera we did in March. And that's it going down. There we are on the bottom. Loads of stuff starts to happen. Those are two relatively large macro carcasses. If you think about when you go to deep sea and everyone says, oh, there's no food. It's all really horrible, slow moving environment. Actually, when you put food down, things do happen. So what we're looking at is the snailfish are not scavenging fish. They don't smell the bait and go, ooh, free, free carcass today. What they do is they associate that smell with being a hard, very large density of, of amphipods. And amphipods are quite interesting in themselves because they've made so many adaptations to very, very deep sea that they do things like they've just given up swallowing. So they're that hungry. They don't even swallow anymore. They have strange bowl-shaped mandibles. They can convert food to lipid very, very quickly. They're basically, this whole scenario is like little sparrows looking for a bag of peanuts, and that's the closest thing you're going to get. So amphipods are very, very important. And if you look at the, the way in which snailfish have evolved, it starts to make a little bit of sense. So that's the snailfish doing what it does best, turning up after about three hours and just spending its time picking off amphipods from bait. So the feeding. The start of this video is from 8,000 meters in the Mariana. Again, 
I wouldn't have personally parked a lander on that, but we don't have much choice no matter. Uh, very big rocks, but you look at this one here doing what they do best in the suction feeding, these larger skiddy amphipods. It's a bit of a close up here, sucks it in. Now, going back to that last video, what's an amphipod going to do when you put it in your mouth? It's clearly going to eat its way out. So you need some sort of secondary mechanism to get it in your mouth and kill it. So if you look at this little 3D CAT scan here, you see the, the teeth at the front. That's obviously for grabbing it and sticking it in its mouth. And then you've got that very, very difficult uh, period of time where you have this thing in your mouth who wants to get out. So what they have is a secondary set of teeth at the back, which is kind of like a grinding plate, if you like. So once it swallows the animal, it basically makes sure it's definitely dead before it enters the stomach. Otherwise, it's going to be like a scene from Alien. Uh, uh, and this is, this is some new technology they've been doing at a uh, facility in Friday Harbour in, in the States. Um, I'm going to do more of this at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, when you pan out as well, we can look at the, some of the, the actual prey items inside. You can see there there's an amphipod that's been recently swallowed. Uh, definitely dead. So when I was looking at the, telling you about those videos and why on earth are those little fish passing out, originally we thought maybe they were just overexcited and had too much lactic acid and just passed out. What it probably is, if you watch very, very closely, quite often the ones that pass out are the ones that you've just seen directly feed. And what they're probably doing is swimming around, trying to get an amphipod. When it does take it, it needs a period to lie on the seafloor while it makes sure it's definitely dead. And it's probably just sitting there. You can't see it, but inside it's probably working like crazy trying to kill this alien in its mouth. So the stomach contents. Two different species of fish, Camerdeck and Mariana, you're looking at much greater than 95% are all amphipods. There's obviously a very significant relationship between the two groups of animals. They do have all sorts of other bits and pieces in their stomach, but nothing very significant. And this suction feeding predatory fishes like halo of paras are probably well off in the halo zone because of the abundance of, uh, of amphipods, which you don't actually see that much of on the abyssal plains. The fish we see on the abyssal plains are much more towards the scavenging community, and they like the big carcasses and, and the white muscle and so on. So transparency and buoyancy, this is a nice little video here, so I'll try and tie some of this together. If you look around its mouth, you see all these little dimples, they're all little pores, probably little uh, vibration sensor pores, which are what it's using to locate the amphipod in the first place. We do have, we have dissected some eyes, the eyes don't have any fluid in them, they're just a lens covered in material, we're not quite sure, we haven't really worked on that yet, but... They are extraordinarily gelatinous. In this video here, you can see why they're called snailfish, because they have the little sucker on their underbelly, although it probably doesn't suck very much in these particular ones. This is what they look like when you, immediately after you capture them. They don't survive very well, in part because they're incredibly gelatinous. And when the landers come to the surface, they, they immediately hit the surface water, and these things start to cook, because the surface water in places like Mariana can be 25 degrees. So it's vitally important that when we sample these, we get them on the deck and get them cold so we can work on them a little bit more. You can see already... My microphone's gone. Oh, I've got a dodgy connection. I'll just keep my finger on it. Anyway, you can see the pores there. And these are morphological characters and more important information about the fish, which unfortunately is lost because they're so gelatinous. If you don't get into these fish quickly, they end up just rotting away, or what they actually look like melting away. So they have this subdermal extracellular matrix. For the all intents and purposes, let's just call it a gel layer. When you cut it or when you leave it out too long and it gets too hot, it does start to disintegrate very, very quickly. And unfortunately, when we're trying to identify it to genus level, some of the, the uh, markers are actually part of the gelatinous characters. So depending on how long you've left this on the deck, it could depend on what genus it ends up as. So we'd now use genetics for that instead. So, Quite a lot of deep sea fish do it, and it seems to be a relatively inexpensive way to, uh, to bulk up. If there's not a lot of food, and you still need a certain body size, and you still need various other things, uh, gel seems to be a, a quite interesting way to do it. So it's probably contributing to its buoyancy, because uh, it's, I think about a third of the animal is, is gel, and it is buoyant. And uh, it's present in several deep sea species. And it's very, very inexpensive to grow. It's probably almost uh, contributing to uh, swimming efficiency as well. This picture here shows one lying on the bench. And if you shine a light through it, you can see how much of it is actually gel. 
And the buoyancy idea is something that happens in quite a lot of deep sea fish. We've already spoken to someone at the break there about the blobfish. There's that famous picture of the big pink blobfish looking really sad and grumpy on the bench. And I think that's rather unfair uh, to the blobfish because the blobfish is basically made of gel uh, and in water it doesn't look anything like that. It's just because it's been taken out and it's looking rather deflated. So gel for swimming, that diagram there, the dark areas show where the main pockets of gel are. And if you were to take those away, you would end up with a body form which is quite inefficient in swimming. It's more of a tadpole type of style. But rather than invest lots of energy into more and more white muscle and creating that hydrodynamic shape, it seems to be that they're just padding it through with gel. They also don't have swim bladders, so they have no means of, of regulating their own buoyancy other than that. And those videos at the start were showing that they are quite comfortable swimming up to at least what looks to be about 10 metres off the seafloor. So that's probably an important part of physiology. Uh, that picture at the bottom is what happens when you preserve them uh, in formalin or ethanol. It's kind of the same. So they look very, very different. So historically, it's quite difficult to go back to some of these older samples because once the gel layer has melted away or fallen off or been pickled like this, they really honestly don't look very much uh, dead than do in life. So it makes identifications from video to historical samples very, very difficult. So we have been looking at ways in which we can take three-dimensional digital images of them as they're fresh and put that, try and put that alongside any specimen that may be preserved. So how old are they? That's a tricky one as well. So recently we'd, we, we had a, a, a project in Mariana and Kermadec and we looked at the otoliths. So the otoliths are the ear bones. They're tiny. If you look at the scale bar and those top ones there, that, that scale bar is one millimetre. They're absolutely tiny, very, very fragile. We managed to cut through them and you essentially count the rings like you count a tree. And we reckon that the ones we caught are between 5 and 16 years old, which is quite a lot less than what you'd expect the age of a lot of deep sea fish out in the abyssal plain to be. So they're probably quite short-lived. One theory as to why that would be the case is probably to do with the amount of seismic activity in the trenches. Every time there's an earthquake, like the big one off Java recently or the big one off Japan, we know for a fact that huge amounts of sediment are moved. There's mass wasting events. The pre-suspended sediment can, can be as high as 4,000 metres off the bottom and remain there for six months. And it probably kills a lot of... Quite a lot. Let me wiggle my cable. There we go. Uh, it might be a case of their survival in the trenches is also aided by the fact they have quite a quick population turnover. If you lose 10% to an earthquake or a smothering event, it doesn't really matter. They'll bounce back like, 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 like rats. I don't know. It's a bad analogy. So the maximum depth, why do they only go to 8,000 metres? That's a question that was quite a hot topic about five years ago. Uh, it's a story involving a guy called Paul Yancey in uh, uh, Whitman College in uh, Seattle, near Seattle. And he was looking at osmolites, in particular in bony fish, this particular osmolite is called trimethylamine N-oxide. And what the osmolite does is maintain fluid balance uh, in the cell. So the cells are full of this thing called the osmolite. And uh, he noticed there was a strange little trend in relatively shallow fish down to 1,000 metres, but it seemed to increase. It doesn't follow any salinity profile, which is weird for an osmolite. And then he did a whole bunch of work when he was looking at much deeper fish down to about 4,500, 5,000 metres, and he found that it was almost very, it was very, very, very linear. And salinity certainly is not linear. It's almost constant beyond 3,000. So he was starting to hypothesise that something's going on here, and this TMEO osmolite is actually what's counteracting the perturbing effects of pressure. But he didn't have any deeper samples. So this is why we ended up hooking up, because I said to him, well, if that's true, let's go and get some snailfish and try it out and see if that fits on his, his line. And after a while, we found another couple of species. And the snailfish basically fit that line beautifully. Absolutely stunning. And what happens at that point is you can't get any more. When you get to about 8,200 meters, you can't put any more TMEO into the cell. It's reached isosmosis. Any more would have a detrimental effect on the fish. So this is one of these things where it's not a sampling artifact. It's not based on some uh, misinterpreted data. What we see with the cameras, we can verify this with the cameras. We can deploy as many times as we want down to about 8,000 meters. And we'll see fish, 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 fish. Get to 8,200, gone. It's as clear as that. And basically, it means that if the fish were to go any deeper than that, you'd reach isosmosis and the cells would start to collapse. So that's a genuine depth limit. 
Why fish would only go to 8,000 and not 10,000 is a bit of a mystery. My personal feeling is 8,000 metres is, a, is an old full ocean depth. If you look at a lot of the trenches, most of them are around 8,000 metres deep and they have a big long corridor at the bottom of around 8,000 metres deep. The ones that go deeper are the ones that have fractured and you have essentially a hole within an 8,000 metre deep trench. So there are no places in the world that we can go to 9, 10 or 11,000 metres and find a big long corridor. They're always pits and it's because the underriding plate has split and created a deeper part of an already deep trench. So one theory is, is that also interesting is that shrimp and decapod and so on, uh, they are exactly the same. They use TMEO, only TMEO. Uh, and the maximum depth of shrimp at the moment is about 7,800. So it seems to be a, a thing with some species. Uh, we haven't got the data yet, but if you look at brittle star, starfish, urchins, and something else that escapes me, the maximum depth is still 8,000 meters. It happens time and time again. When Monty was talking about the sharks raising chimeras, sharks raising chimeras use two. They use TMEO and urea, and they will reach isosmosis around 3,500 meters as well. So the mechanism is the same, but the depth is slightly less. And what's weird, when you go deeper than that, the animals which go much deeper suddenly have an absolutely unnatural pressure tolerance. So we think then that these are evolved, specifically evolved limits to various animals, and anything that can go all the way is probably an accident or a byproduct of something else. The amphipods, for example, can survive decompressions which are 10 times greater than anything they would ever experience in the natural world, which makes me think it's not a, a deliberate adaptation. It's just crazy. You can bring them up from 6,000 meters, repressurize them, and some of them will resuscitate. Why would you evolve the ability to do that? So there's lots of work to be done in terms of pressure adaptation. So I'm not quite finished yet, but in summary, the deepest fish in the world are snailfish. They're not a deep sea fish per se. They're a shallow water fish, which has decided to go all the way. There's quite a lot of them. In places we've looked, at least anyway, there tends to be two or three species in each trench, which are endemic to that trench. They're not necessarily well related to one another. They're limited to 8,200 meters because of things like TMEO and um, molecular limitations. Incredible similarities in terms of body size. Again, I want to show the global trends in body size. These things fit exactly there. They're normally about between 10 and 20 centimeters. You've yet to see a big one ever. Uh, they're largely gelatinous, which is probably an inexpensive solution to swimming efficiency and or buoyancy. They live to be at least 16 years old. And they're very likely to be found in various other trenches. So over the next 12 months, we're going to go to the Puerto Rico Trench, South Sandwich Trench in Antarctica, Diamantina Fracture Zone in Java Trench in the Indian Ocean, and so on. And the chances are we'll find those there. And once we start to get more and more samples, we can start to look at the phylogeny and start to have a, a proper reorganization of it. Because at the moment, the morphological characters of the fish don't necessarily mirror what's happening genetically. So I think these are one group of fish that need quite a lot of work done on that. But the take home message from some of this and things to just have a think about is whether or not these fish are actually rare or not. Whenever these things get in the press, everyone's like super rare, deep sea fish found, ooh, it's all scary and weird. I don't think they are. I don't think they're rare at all. I think they're actually quite highly abundant. They're just difficult. So if you think about it like this, there's a the Mariana Trench there. The Mariana Trench is 2,500 kilometers long. The Himalaya is 2,400 kilometers long. Challenger Deep in the Mariana is 10,000 meters, 900, 10,900. Mount Everest is 8,500 or 8,800 or whatever it is. So volume-wise, the Mariana Trench is about the same as the Himalaya. And the Atacama Trench is about the same as the Andes because it's the Atacama Trench which is pushing the Andes up. If you look at the length and the heights and altitudes involved, they're about the same size. Now, if you think of the available space that an animal has to inhabit, if you're at the base of a mountain, you have lots and lots of space. The higher up the mountain you go, the less and less space you have until there's one sorry mountain goat stood on the top of Mount Everest with no space for anybody else. If you think Mariana Trench, or any other trench for that matter, the, bit, the shallow end is the biggest bit by far, and the deeper you go, the less and less space there is until you end up at the deepest point. So it's the same thing. So if you take the area, or at least the percentage of the trench or mountain that falls within the habitat, preferred habitat of that species, you start to think about it in a different way. So those snailfish, we find them between six and a half and 8,000 meters. That means they're inhabiting something like 70 to 80% of the entire Mariana Trench. 
Now, if you had an animal that whenever you put food down anywhere on the Himalaya, that within two or three hours you would have 20 in front of your camera, and they were there 80% uh, of the entire Himalaya, you wouldn't necessarily say they were rare anymore. Right? It's just they're not actually rare. What they are, they're just very difficult for us to see and very difficult for us to study. So I think the more we start to look at that and the more we can change the perspective on how significant some of these fish are. For example, if you take the big cuscules, the big, the big brown one I showed at the start, if you look at the footprint of that in the Pacific Ocean, it's actually huge. It's probably 40% of the planet is occupied by great big dumb looking brown fish that no one's ever heard of. 40% of the planet, not 40% uh, of the Pacific Ocean. So I'll leave you with that, a little thing to think about. And this is all published in various uh, uh, journals. We've been quite good and quite quick at putting this information out as and when we get it. We'll have a couple of more papers to come out in the foreseeable. Uh, we just thanks to, there's been lots and lots of people involved in this, particularly the people who did the CAT scans at Friday Harbour, the bathymetry was BGS, with video clips in there from NHK and from Blue Planet and so on and so on. So we thank all those people. And I would like to have, do we have 10 minutes? Five minutes? Five minutes for some questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. This was very interesting again. Huh? Um, we have time for questions. So is there anyone in the audience who want to know more details? Yes. Uh, we have. We'll try that one. Hi. Um, hi. Hello. I'm Alan Bruno from MSC. Uh, I was just actually wondering, when you bring them up, the fishes, mm -hmm. you said that, yeah, they disintegrate quite quickly in the heat. But if you would keep them like in really cold water, would they survive? Yeah, if you use insulated traps, they'll probably keep them for a bit longer. But trying to keep them at less than two degrees it becomes quite an engineering challenge. So you can insulate traps with things like synthetic foam, which might keep it down to less than 10 degrees easily. But any more than that, you're looking at actual cooling systems and things that have to be then be 8,000 meter rated and suddenly the cost of your vehicle gets ridiculous. But they don't need a pressure? No. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't see any value in bringing them up at pressure because you're, you're then going to study an animal that has no hiding instinct whatsoever because it's always lived in the dark in a, in a tube, which is probably not going to be the most representative of its current state of mind. So, and again, pressure traps, bringing them up, have a whole set of problems from being phenomenally expensive to being potential bombs on the deck. So kind of stay away from that. We had another two questions over here. They have huge amounts of eggs. We find them quite a lot of time, but it doesn't we've really looked into much about the reproduction except for the egg size and the fact that most females seem to have them. So we think the reproduction is, is all year round and quite a fast turnover. There's one weird thing as well. I don't know if I'll, shall I explain this, Tom? Tom's in the audience as well. If you, if you need any more questions, go to that guy. But the one thing I didn't mention when we looked at the otolith uh, data was if you look at the oxygen isotopes, and we had this checked checked and double checked and even went to people at NASA to check that the machine was right. What it seems to show is it's immediately after the larval stage or the, is it the and during the larval stage, isn't it? The temperature that they, were, they sit at for a year is five degrees. And that's what the otolith says. So it says basically you, you, you hatch, you spend a year at five degrees and then you spend the rest of your life at two degrees. Now we can't find anywhere in these trenches which is five degrees. The only way to get to five degrees is to float to 1,000 metres, which in this case would be 6,000 metres off the bottom, hang around, floating around for a year, and then descend back down into a very specific narrow band of the correct depth within the trench. So that's something we need to try and resolve, because it's, it's, yeah. it's a difficult one to just go, oh, yeah, I agree with that. So, yeah. The what, sorry? Well, the snake is related, has, has the snake is the relation to the comodons. The comodons? The comodons. The old uh, fish, like 
Oh, right. Yeah, I, 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 that's probably a question from Monty. Do you know that? No. No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, I have, my name is Boo Fernholm. I have a question uh, to the uh, uh, autolites. Uh, what, what, what are the cues that give the uh, annuals uh, for, for the autolites? What are the changes it's in probably uh, environment during the year? Down se there? Seasonal input of, of food after the spring blooms. There are still huge degrees of seasonality off New Zealand. And where we can resolve that more would be to go to more oligotrophic, more stable trenches. So a nice example, if you look at Kermadec versus Tonga, they're the same, almost the same trench. There's a huge spring bloom off New Zealand that doesn't cut into Tonga, it's only Kermadec. So that food then will descend and then amphipods will be more abundant and all the different epifaunal species will come up and that should put a pulse down on the otolith. But then there are other places like Tonga where it doesn't seem to have that. So that's, that would be an interesting one to try and get fish from other areas. The other thing we want to do as well is go to Japan in about a year's time and catch more of those fish because hopefully we can pick up the cesium from Fukushima. Hopefully, he says. That's terrible. But uh, there might be a, a radioisotope signature in the otolith because we know exactly when the cesium from Fukushima arrived on the deep sea floor. It took 66 days, I think, to get to 7,000 metres. So. That'll be an interesting one to try and validate other results. Terrible, Thank but very convenient. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I think uh, we've had a lot of questions. And my last one is, you mentioned, uh, or when I watched the videos, I would say, they look very similar. Yes. So what is the main difference in taxon taxonomy between the different places you showed? The main difference is there's a little bit of difference within the, the morphology of the sucker on its belly. There's differences in, is it fin rays as well? Really, really cryptic things. Yeah, the head pores and stuff like that. So when we, if you use morphological characters, they fall into two or three different uh, genres. But when you sequence them genetically, that's not really working out at the moment. So there's probably quite a big job. I think when we expand what we've got in the deep snailfish, and I think I believe there's somebody who's about to publish a paper on some of the shallow water ones, and I think their main conclusion is that it, the morphological taxonomy doesn't work because it's too cryptic. And it might be being confused because a lot of the characters are within the gel layer, and that just doesn't exist in a lot of historical samples. So, so it's more the DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I think we give a big hand to Alain.